so much for that. Yeah, um, I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, if, if you might have seen me, those at the front, this is my first time coming to FFCOMP. Um, and I don't think it will be the last if that's a round of applause that I'm getting before I've even said anything. Should have told you just to hold it, because you never know, it might like five minutes in, you're like, wait, what? I take it back. Can I get a refund on applause? I don't know. But yeah, um, yeah, no, it's really great being here. And thank you so much to Remy for inviting me. Thank you so much to Julie for all the work that's been going on to organize it. Um, and yeah, I'm really, I personally am really excited uh, about the program for today. Um, and I hope everyone else here is as well. Um, so yeah, welcome to my talk, uh, designing as we want to create the experiences that we need. I am aware it does sound very pretentious, but I also thought, well, I am a designer. I think I can get away with that. That's kind of what we do. Um, but yes, you, can, you will have to forgive me uh, for, for that. But I thought just to kind of kick off a bit of an introduction um, to myself. So yeah, um, I, I guess more for context, just you know, in case you know, you're just like, wait, who is this random person? What's she on about? But yeah, so for context, who am I? I am someone who kind of has Maybe many hats, maybe too many hats. I don't know. We shall see. Um, so yes, I work as a user experience and a service designer. Um, I'm also like a qualitative researcher. I'm a pigeon enthusiast. Uh, I'm a Gilbert and Sullivan warbling mezzo soprano. Um, I make zines. I do all kinds of like interesting and um, weird stuff. But I like to think that the thing that connects everything is a real interest in complicated problems. I'm someone who really, really loves in-depth, complex, and complicated problems. Um, and, I, and I think as part of that, some of it might also come from the fact of like, you know, coming, being born to parents who were kind of recent immigrants to the UK. I'm really obsessed with systems. I love understanding and just observing and seeing how people work in reality, rather than what, how they say they work. Um, and so, you know, if you, know, you ever want to get like down and nerdy during the breaks about languages and systems thinking, you know, I'm, I'm here for it. I love that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, so yeah, that's me. Um, and now, yeah, let's, let's get on to the talk, um, designing as we want to create the experiences that we need. Okay, so perhaps unsurprisingly, um, as someone who's really obsessed like, with systems and look, thinking about design from that systems perspective, one of the most like, fascinating areas of critical design theory that I came across was socio-technical socio design. Um, particularly fascinating for me, also as a heads up, I'm not someone who had like, a proper design background. Uh, I'm very much like a failed wannabe physicist and then had to kind of get a real job and start paying the bills. So that's how I kind of ended up in, in UX. So actually I spent a lot of time really trying to understand like the history of the field that I was working in. Um, and yeah, they're one of the critical areas of design, socio-technical um, design, which was kind of like really sort of like, I suppose, first documented, first like really kickstarted by Albert Kearns, who's like amazing. Um, his papers are fantastic. Um, I found that so fascinating because a lot of the, of the theory is really focusing about how the way we work actually is revealed or kind of like demonstrated, kind of given evidence by the stuff that we make. Um, and so, you know, you can see that in some of the principles. So I think when he first wrote his papers, um, I think there's like around nine fundamental, like, principles of social technical design. I'm not going to go into all of them. I'm just going to mention some of the ones that I think are kind of the most resonant, I th I perhaps. Um, so there's one principle about like compatibility. So this idea that your process of design, of making something, has to be compatible with the ultimate objective. So that's something that takes into account like the medium you're working in, something that takes into account the scale of it, all of that stuff has to be somehow supported by um, the funda the ba that background process, right? <clears throat> so there's, a, there's a principle called minimal critical specification, uh, which anyone who's, who's really into lean product kind of might sound very uh, kind of familiar. Um, and that kind of very much talks about the idea of like, you know, when you're making something, you don't need to kind of specify beyond that, which is absolutely essential. Boundary location. So again, I think in modern, in our contemporary like corporate speak that's all about breaking down silos 
And in completion, which obviously, as a designer, I really love. So this, I, this acknowledgement of the fact that like, design in itself is this iterative process. <clears throat> I really love the little quote there. The closure of options always opens new ones. So like I said, in many ways, these are kind of fairly basic. And you know, a lot of this stuff was first properly theorized in like the mid 70s. And it's kind of interesting, I think, also for those of us who work you know, as digital makers, because often it can seem like our field is so new. But I think it's actually really good to remember the lineage and the history of our field. Not least because when consultants come along charging you like a couple of thousands, you can say, oh, it's fine, there's a free paper by Albert Kearns. I don't know if you know about him from like 1976. We're good, we're good. Um, but I think it is really cool to kind of think, of, to think about that lineage, right? And the fact that so much of this stuff that was theorized in the 70s and in fact itself was based on older theories, it's the kind of stuff that we use that we talk about to this day, whether it's in lean UX, lean product development, um, Scrum, all of that, Agile, all of that stuff actually kind of has always been part of like our, our design, our making heritage. But that actually is technically another talk. So the reason why I wanted to kind of mention this is the fact that, you know, the, the, the foundation of kind of being able to create and design really complicated, complex and interesting products actually comes from these nine really, really simple kind of quite basic principles that certainly to us now are kind of like, well, yeah, duh, obviously. Um, but I think for me, kind of from a design perspective, one of the things I'm trying to apply from that is this idea that, hey, you know, when we're dealing with these really big questions that we kind of are increasingly these days, right, questions of ethical design, questions of holistic design, questions of sustainable and environmentally friendly and environmentally considerate design, actually one of the things that's kind of reassuring is the fact that, like, in spite of all this, these really big questions and some of our very specific niche contexts, like the solution might be something that often comes about from something that's quite simple, right? As I like to say, new solutions often emerge from the simple interactions between the actors within the system. And that's something that, again, Come, you can see that in the um, theorizing of socio-technical design. If you're more like into like systems thinking or complex systems, then again, that again is exactly how complexity arises. Um, and it's kind of reassuring, I think. I think it's especially reassuring because in light of all those really big questions that we're increasingly asking ourselves, one of the things I've kind of noticed happens a lot is that when people do maybe experiment with like these holistic design frameworks or kind of these ethical design frameworks, there seems to be a point where it's easy to get stuck, right? It's kind of really complex, it's kind of really deep. Some of it's kind of emotionally taxing. And you're kind of left there very much thinking, okay, but, but what's next, right? So I've got all this stuff, I've uncovered all this information. What, what do I do with that? Um, Sometimes what's needed is kind of just like a reframing and a rethinking about like the underlying logics of so many of the really basic and really simple tools that we use. So again, to address complexity, often what you need are like the simplest, um, easiest steps to take. Now that's not to say sometimes it can't be a bit of a mess, but you know, in the spirit of kind of the former scenario, what I'm really hoping you will get out of this presentation today um, it's just that, like some of those like really simple, common, um, familiar techniques that can help maybe help us kind of start cutting, cutting up the, um, the elephant to kind of borrow a terminology from service design, right? We've got these big problems. How can we use the simple everyday techniques um, in design to kind of to address them? Oh, uh, yes. So how can we use, you know, our tools that we already have to address and to solve these really big, complex problems. I also think it's really important <clears throat> to kind of be open with one's definitions. Obviously, yes, I personally work as a UX and service designer. I will be using the term designer a lot. Um, hopefully, remember to interchange it with maker. But for the purpose of this talk, when I'm saying designer, I really don't mean like it's specifically a UX or a UI designer. I, there's a particular quote that I'm always paraphrase, always quoting as paraphrased by Milton Glaser. 
It's a bit of a personal cliche. I should probably find another one, but I really like it. Um, and it's the definition of a designer as someone who moves things from an existing condition to a preferred one. And in my opinion, that applies to every single person in this space. So for the context of this talk, just in case there's any like annoying anyone from like design Twitter who'll get at me like, mm, well, if everyone's a designer, no one's a designer. It's like, yeah, 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 it's, it's fine, it's fine. I was born in the discourse, you merely adopted it. <laughs> for, for, for the purpose of this talk alone, everyone here is a designer. Cool, let's get into it. <clears throat> So one of the things that I found is like there's, this, there's a range now of these frameworks, right, for to help us kind of do the sort of ethical and holistic design. Um, I personally really like starting off with like the, the design justice framework. It's kind of nice and, and fairly simple, at least to start off with. You start off thinking about who is it that you're actually making for, who is it that might be harmed, and who is it that might materially benefit. And I think that, that bit's also it's quite important to emphasize them materially. When you do this, often what then happens is that you can start like kind of creating like little subgroups, right? You start understanding the different, maybe by demographics, maybe by kind of um, the jobs to be done, whatever, however you do it. You can start then um, kind of, yeah, distilling it further, right? Understand the different groups within each of these different categories. Sometimes you can even add other categories as well, subcategories as well. One of the things that I also then tend to like to do, um, especially because of the fact that I kind of do come from that systems thinking background, is kind of once you start to understand, okay, who is this product, who is this service actually for, who is it that will benefit, and who is it that might potentially be excluded or harmed, and in what way, is also to start mapping out some of the relationships, right? So um, this is a technique often where, like, Okay, you'll say, okay, if this group is benefiting in this way, this other group as a result might also benefit, or they might not benefit. And so you kind of like map out the relationships between these different groups kind of in, in this kind of way, like with arrows, with like a positive or a negative. Um, if you're really fancy, you've done all that data, you've got all the right research, you might even be able to add like different weights to your arrows to let you know exactly to what extent someone is benefiting and to what extent someone else might not be benefiting. But then often what happens is, you know, you will end up at a point where you have this stuff, you've kind of done this, like, ethical analysis of the system, um, and, yeah, the question then is, like, okay, well, what next? It's, it's just a mess. It's really complicated. It's kind of interesting, maybe a bit depressing. I don't know what to do with this. Like, I'm literally just here to make an app. Like, okay, <laughs> what is it? Well, I kind of feel that, you know, if we've made this effort to start mapping out the relationships, well, one of the things that we could start doing is actually start framing, um, using kind of some of those design techniques, framing some of those relationships using like how might we questions, right? So maybe it could be a challenge, like how can I, how might we change the relationship that these particular um, audiences or personas or archetypes, how can we start, how might we change this relationship how might we balance something out over here? How might we exacerbate something else over there? You can use tools like the kind of five wise, wise technique to further dig in and kind of create even more um, kind of like on a more, um, how might we questions on a more detailed level, right? And then kind of relating it, finding ways of relating this back to kind of our actual like practical products, the stuff that we're having to actually code and, and make, we can often use things like, um, like what's called like FAB statements, right? So where actually you can start thinking about, when you're thinking about the product that you're making, you're thinking about it in terms of like the feature, the particular thing that like someone's interacting with, the advantage that gives them, and then the overall benefit that that gives, that that makes to their lives. And actually then what you can, then do is kind of link that back to the how might we questions. So instead of just coming up with like a very vague benefit, that benefit perhaps could be one of those how might we questions, um, or at least the answer to one of those how might we questions, obviously, which in turn has been derived from really understanding these relationships between the different actors and the different groups within a system. So, 
Ultimately then, one can, simply by using these really, really basic techniques of kind of the how might we question, the five whys to dig even further, um, and the feature advantage benefit framework, one can go from actually quite a complicated set of like problematics down to things that actually could be really testable, that you can create solid hypotheses around, um, and actually be able to concretely be able to investigate actually what is the harm or what is the impact that just clicking on this button could have potentially on the different user groups. And this is something I think can also be done with, um, like, say, with other uh, frameworks as well. So obviously, I've kind of just mentioned the design justice framework. I personally am a big fan of like values and actor mapping, um, partly because like, well, I love systems. Um, it's a nice way of like displaying the system to people who are part of it. Um, and actually, the workshops that we, that I, the method I use for this is actually quite fun. So if you ever kind of want, if you ever would be interested in having it like tried out in your context, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to come along um, and demonstrate it. But really, it's quite simple, actually. Um, there's a bunch of exercises you do to make sure you understand the values that you're working to, your actual values, um, not the values that um, one's company might espouse, um, and all the different actors within that system. And then what you do is you start trying to map the two things against each other, right? So for this particular value, what does it mean for this particular actor in the system? Sometimes it doesn't mean anything. Sometimes it means something contradictory to another actor in the system. That's the purpose of this kind of framework, right? It's all about kind of opening up those contradictions, um, all about opening up the system to the actors within the system. And the nice thing is that, yeah, you begin to see where maybe your KPIs or metrics aren't quite meshing. Maybe one team's goals actually subtly undermine another team's goals, and that's why overall it's really hard maybe to get like a feature out um, in good time. Again, this can very quickly end up very similar to using the design justice framework. You can end up with like a lot of post-it notes, a lot of comments, um, people feeling very much, okay, I think I kind of got like the system that I'm kind of working in, but like I don't really know what else to do with this. I now see the contradictions, but I don't really know where I go from here. Ultimately, because the purpose of this isn't just to sit and admire it, it's really about bringing it back down to all those other assets, all those kind of like, as I said, really kind of basic, quite common design assets that we use all the time to design, to do human-centered design. So identifying a problematic or a threat is one thing, um, but ultimately what you can also do is start finding out how some of these, um, how the con you can actually start using the contradictions, for example, as pain points within, say, a persona. I know, I know, again, design Twitter, they do love to chat their chat. Um, I'm, this, is not a, this is not a debate about whether personas are good or not. I'm simply saying that, hey, this is a tool that you can use that have been used for ages. And actually, this is how you can connect something that, again, is really kind of bog standard, really quite basic, in some ways quite boring. But this is how you can, um, once you've done these really complicated, interesting, like ethical, holistic design, like evaluations and analysis, actually, these are the very basic tools, as I said, that you can use to bring all of that stuff home, bring it down to something that's really like, that you can actually test, that you can use when you're doing your user testing, when you're validating your user stories. Um, that's kind of what, what this is all, this, that's kind of what this is all about. One of the other issues, and this probably is something that maybe is a bit more for like the designer designers, I think sometimes there's almost like a, uh, an over-centering of the designer in ways that are either too self-deprecating or kind of too or basically overvaluing. Um, and that comes out when, when kind of we get into these weird loops where we think, okay, well, we've done all this work, but is this actually such a problem? Is it me, or is it just me being a bit of a snowflake? Do, like, do people really care that much about their personal security? Like, is, is this actually such a big deal? Do people understand, like, embodied racism and algorithms? Like, really, like, am I just overthinking this? Um, and I will say, well, actually, one of the things I have always found in conversations with people, whether technical or not technical, as they would often self-describe themselves, is that actually 
most people do care, and most people are thinking about this stuff. They're just using a different language. So again, you know, from a UX perspective, certainly, you know, as I said, trying to think about, well, what are the tools, what are the really ordinary tools that we can use to kind of dig into these complicated topics? You can use something like card sorting, basically. You can use that as a way of really understanding the different languages that people use. So like when you're saying like threat model, like how does that, how is that communicated or translated to your user base? Again, using something as simple as like card sorting. After all, understanding how people think, understand words, it's just another form of information architecture mapping, to be honest, right? So again, I, I guess, again, it's just another example of how quite complicated and quite complex problems and, and, and topics and, and ideas still can be very easily distilled using these kind of, again, very simple, basic techniques. Um, and that, in turn, will give you something that, yeah, isn't just like a wall full of post-it notes, but actually something that, yeah, can be tested, can be validated um, as you're kind of encountering your users. So yeah, I guess if there is one thing to take away, it's that, you know, I think deeper systems and analysis and classic UX techniques, no matter what, you know, design Twitter may say, um, I think can kind of often get you in a really, really good and interesting place. A lot of it is about kind of maybe just under, really taking the time to think about, well, what actually is the underlying logic of either the methodology or what actually is the underlying thing I'm really trying to get out of, um, out of even my users or trying to understand about the system that I'm designing for. There are lots of different analogs for this kind of stuff as well, which I tend to find, which I find quite lovely. So there's um, a UX designer and design strategist who I super admire um, called Alison Atford. And he models a lot, he, when he talks about um, kind of using these everyday techniques, he uses like the language from martial arts. So he calls them like facilitation kata, right? So they, these are like the exercises that you do re repeatedly to the point that it just becomes part of like your body memory so that if you get into like a fight situation or anything, you almost, you just automatically start doing them. I myself, again, it's very cliche for like a, a middling millennial. Uh, tend to do a lot of crochet. So for me, my mental model is stitches because I know that, yeah, you learn a couple of basic stitches, but it's the way that you can combine them um, at different points in time. That's what gives you really interesting, fascinating patterns. So again, it all comes down to that, like, very simple techniques and tools are all that's needed often to address or to create um, or to redress quite complex um, systems. So yeah, I mean, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk how a lot of the time we have these big complicated things, we have these new and interesting frameworks, um, and when we're stuck, a lot of the time kind of what's needed is something of a reframing. Um, but I think it's also true that sometimes that question of what next, it isn't because we've forgotten a particular tool, it's not because of anything else, it literally is just because it's a mess. Like, these are really hard, tough problems. And so what do we do? I have to be honest, actually I'm not entirely sure, um, but what I suspect is that it's in those times when we really have a lot of mess to deal with, that's when we really see the importance of relationship to good design. And remember, I'm talking design in the broadest possible sense here. The designer Anika Hanstein Azora, when asked about the concept of universal design and the question of like, oh, well, who, can, who are, are white cishet designers allowed to design then for different communities? Um, they reply that ultimately, in their opinion, it's more about relationship. It's more about like anyone who doesn't have a relationship with the community they are designing for simply can't design for that community. It's not even so much about like it being illegal almost. It's just like you, ta you physically, tangibly cannot design for that community. And so I think extrapolating from this, when we come across these times of tension, when we're looking at the systems we have either built or are contributing to and just see all this mess, and we don't know which direction to go to. And it doesn't matter how many great little tips or tools or catters or stitches that you've got. You're just not getting anywhere with the problem. Perhaps those are the times to really reflect on our relationships, right? 
Are we in relationship with the community that we're serving? Should we be bringing in people who can lead us, who have those relationships? What kind of relationship is it even that we want to generate? Is it going to be reparative? Is it going to be nurturing? Is it going to be serving? Is it going to be one of solidarity, or are we going to be running defense for the community? Remember how I said earlier that often we can still use tried and tested techniques? I guess even there, there's a couple of how might we questions. A couple of like, oh, how do we understand the mental model exercises that could be used? <clears throat> when I talk about community, so it's not simply about the user communities we're working with, it's also about, it was also a cross design as well. Um, if we consider ourselves Individu as individuals, irrespective of the companies and the organizations and the collectives that we work for, if we consider ourselves part of this bigger design system, do we have the spaces and the skills to wrestle with each other over these big questions? Can we make ourselves the space we need? And so when I'm talking about the design community, I, there is a part where like, I actually think Kind of, and it kind of goes back to that earlier point I was trying to make about why it's important to understand our lineage, to, really, to, do, to take the time to read up about the early cyberneticians of like the 50s and the, the 40s and the 50s. That's fine. Because actually that is part of our heritage. You know, they were also solving impossible problems. We're here because of many impossible problems that were solved. I think there's something about kind of looking broader, right? Learning from our fellow designers in other fields. I mean, people, we don't necessarily have to copy their methodologies all the time, but you know, there is stuff that we can learn from our cousins who are working in architecture or fashion or product design, right? And then from the other perspective, there is that idea of still, yes, as digital design, we are still fairly new. So we are still creating new emergent communities. Like I'm particularly thinking about the decolonizing design communities, but particularly also the design justice networks. Um, I would really highly re recommend that you do take the time to like check in. A lot of them are across the pond, but it is worth it. There's some really fantastic conversations going on about smart cities and, and co-design that, that are happening. Um, because whilst there's a wealth that we can learn from other designers, there's definitely it doesn't mean that we can't keep on exploring how to create our own legacies. So yeah, at points of tension, remember, relationship is at the heart of good design, of real design. And sometimes those relationships are kind of fraught. Um, but as I said, like other, other people have gone through impossible problems. We can also like, get, get through them too, if we remember this. Anyway, so yeah, that's enough from me. I hope that's enough food for thought. And I also hope that you know, some of the, the tips I gave are actually genuinely practical. Maybe it's me being in too much of a teacher mode, but that is genuinely something I'm always concerned about. You come up here on stage, give all these great like, kind of theoretical talks, and you know, there's nothing really to take home to work um, the next day. So yeah, I hope there was something practical. I hope there was something inspiring. Um, and yeah, get out there, build community and accountability, have fun and experiment, and design authentically. Thank you.